It was the spring of 1900 when a group of Greek sponge divers got blown off course by a storm and came across a wreck of an ancient Roman ship. The vessel, which had sunk more than 2,000 years before, was literally loaded with treasures. A year later, a spectacular hull of antiquities was brought up to the surface. And among those precious items, there was something amazing. Divers found a startlingly complex cosmological calculator. It was one of the world's first analog computers, and it was made by the ancient Greeks between the 3rd and the 1st century BCE. It could track the phases of the moon and the position of the planets, but we can't give all the credit to the Greeks. Most scientists believe that their knowledge was based on the learning of a much earlier civilization. The ancient Babylonians were considered the first astronomers, and no wonder, they were enthusiastic stargazers. For example, around 6,000 years ago, they built watchtowers to scan the sky. And after mapping the stars and visible planets, they recorded their observations on clay tablets. Now, let me tell you about the most paradoxical thing. The observations made by the ancient Babylonians were extremely precise. They were the first known people to predict eclipses. They successfully calculated the length of a year. But their understanding of the cosmos? Oh boy, it was so different from ours. See for yourself, they imagined their world as an oyster surrounded by water. Their sky was a solid dome. Moisture sometimes seeped through this dome as rain. The waters from below sometimes broke through this dome in the form of natural springs. And every day, the sun, the moon, and the stars took part in a slow dance across the ceiling. They entered from the east and exited in the west. Now let's move on to another great nation, the ancient Egyptians. Their universe was rectangular, kind of box-like. At first, they believed the sky was a cow, with each of its feet planted at each corner of the rectangular earth. Later, they changed their mind. They started to compare the sky to a vaulted metal lid. The deities of the sun and moon sailed along the river, flowing upon an elevated gallery running around the inner walls of the box. Early Greek cosmology was no less exciting. Their world resembled a floating disk that was surrounded by Oceanus. That was a majestical mythical river encircling the world. But this theory was soon debunked. With time, the ancient Greeks started making tremendous advances in figuring out how the universe actually worked. Even better, they became the driving force behind the development of Western astronomy and science. If we speak about the solar system, in the past, there were two theories about what it looked like. The first one was called heliocentric. That's because the sun was considered to be the center of the known universe. Earth was believed to revolve around the sun once a year and rotate around its axis once a day. At least, this theory managed to correctly map all the planets known at that time in order of their distance from the sun. The other theory was known as the Earth-centered model of the universe. According to it, our planet was the center of the universe, and all other space bodies, including the Sun, rotated around Earth. This model was around for about 1400 years. It was toppled only in the 16th century. You might have heard that in the past, people believed that our planet was flat. Interestingly, this myth had already been debunked by the 5th century BCE. It was widely accepted that our planet was a sphere. Ancient astronomers watched lunar eclipses and observed the shadow our planet cast on the moon. It was clearly round, which made them conclude that Earth was a sphere. And still, despite some correct theories, the ideas of ancient civilizations about the world often seem somewhat funny and naive to us. On the other hand, guys, I guess the day will come when our descendants will start discussing our theories about space, and I bet they'll find them both ridiculous and amusing too. Phantasmagory is said to be the first animated film ever. It was made in 1908, and it's one of the earliest examples of hand-drawn animation. But did you know that ancient people entertained children with cartoons about 2.6 million years ago? 
A new study reveals that ancient people were the ones who first made pictures look animated. How? They carved pictures of animals on stones and placed them around fires. When the light starts bouncing around, those ancient animals just can't help but shake it and shimmy. The prehistoric carvings come to life in the flickering firelight, with those animals jumping in and out of focus like they're ready to party. Imagine how fun it would have been for prehistoric families to sit around a fire and create these animated carvings. It turns out that even some of the ancient wall paintings and carvings found in caves were inspired by their appearance in the moving light and shadows of flames. So, basically, these old-timey carvings were made to come to life when firelight hit them. And now researchers made a movie showing that cool effect on a 3D model of some horse engravings. The study says our brains are wired to see moving things and changing light, which is why these carvings probably mattered to our ancestors. In other words, cave people were like, Hey, let's carve some cool stuff on this rock, and when we light a fire, it'll look like it's moving. And now these scientists were like, That's awesome! Let's make a movie to show this, everyone! Andy Needham and his teammates used modern scanning and virtual reality tech to study 50 flat carved rocks called plaquettes made of limestone. These rocks were found in southern France back in the 1800s and now sit in a museum in London. They are covered in 77 realistic carvings of all sorts of animals, like horses, reindeer, and chamois. Apparently, Homo sapiens, with a lot of time on their hands, made these engravings a whopping 12,000 to 16,000 years ago. Needham realized that many of these carved rocks were harmed by fire, some covered in white ash, others dried or fractured because of heat. Upon closer examination, he discovered pink bands of discoloration resulting from iron deposits in the stone. What's more interesting is that the animal engravings were often superimposed on top of each other, sometimes even melded together, or fitted around each other like some kind of prehistoric animal jigsaw puzzle. Rather than tossing out the old and starting anew, the ancient artists took animal body parts to create new hybrids. For instance, one of the rocks depicts both a horse and a wild cattle-like creature known as a bovid. In this masterpiece of prehistoric art, the horse's abdomen and neck become the back and neck of the bovid, while the horse's head forms the bovid's ear. What a creative way of recycling! Researchers believe that the prehistoric rocks from Montestric were used as primetime entertainment for our ancestors. More than one person carved the animals. People from different levels of skills showed their artistic glory, and it was a group effort. The fact that these rocks were found together also suggests that this was a community activity. So it's like families were all gathered around the TV, carving rocks and cheering on their favorite carved animals. Who needs Netflix when you have Paleolithic TV? The engravings on these rocks and the signs they were exposed to heat suggest they were created to look like they were moving. Sometimes you see different animals in different poses, so one would come to life, and then another, and then a different one. It's like a Stone Age version of Disney. Similar techniques might have influenced some of the ancient cave paintings, such as those at the breathtaking Chauvet Cave in southeastern France. The animal portraits there are also overlaid on each other, and some look like they were heated by fires underneath them, which means that our prehistoric ancestors might have been the first animators in the world. Alright, since we talked about young people's favorite pastime activity, shall we take a trip back in time to discover the world's oldest toys? One of the most ancient toys discovered was a simple ball made from clay and found in the ruins of ancient Mesopotamia. It might seem like a simple toy, but our ancestors were playing with them as far back as 3000 BC. But back then, they didn't have fancy video games or elaborate board games, so a ball was the pinnacle of entertainment. But the Mesopotamians weren't the only ones having fun. In ancient Greece, children played with dolls made of clay. In Egypt, kids had toys shaped like animals, but they also had dolls made from materials like clay, papyrus, and ivory. But the most impressive thing about these dolls? They had movable limbs. That's right, our ancient ancestors were playing with articulated dolls before it was cool. But it's not all fun and games. Toys also had a practical purpose back in the day. In fact, Many of the toys discovered by archaeologists were actually used to teach children important skills. For example, Egyptian children played with dolls that were shaped like doctors, which helped them learn about medicine and healthcare. And let's not forget about the toys that were used to train future warriors. In ancient China, kids played with toy horses and chariots, 
which helped them prepare for a life of battle. Talk about getting a head start on your career! Moving on to primitive board games, which have been around for over 5,000 years. The oldest board game is called Sinet, and was discovered in ancient Egyptian tombs. It's a bit like a cross between chess and backgammon, and it was so popular that it was played for over 2,000 years. Now that's a game with staying power. But let's not forget about toys for the little ones. Archaeologists have found ancient rattles and whistles that were used to entertain even younger members of their families. And if you thought your kid's toy collection was impressive, just wait until you hear about the ancient Egyptian princess who had over 100 wooden toys in her chamber. But perhaps the most surprising toy of all was the yo-yo. That's right. The yo-yo has been around for over 2,000 years. It was first invented in ancient Greece and was often used in battle, believe it or not. But eventually people realized that it was much more fun to just play with it and do tricks. Marbles are also around as a toy that has been entertaining kids, and some adults, for thousands of years. Archaeologists have found evidence of marble dating back to around 5,000 years ago in the Indus Valley Civilization. Back in those days, marbles were made from all sorts of things. Want to take a wild guess? Okay, I'll tell you. Fruit pits and small pieces of smoothed stone. That's right, those ancient kids were getting creative with their playthings. Some artisans even went the extra mile and crafted marbles from clay. Let's head back to ancient Egyptians and their adorable miniature boats made from ivory, wood, and clay. These miniatures may be acknowledged as toys, but they were also meant to represent crossing over to the other side. Viking kids had similar types of items too. A wooden toy boat over a thousand years old was found on a farmstead near the coast of Norway. This toy looked like a real boat, and it would have been the ultimate cool thing just like how kids today go nuts over race cars and drones. You can imagine little ones back then showing off their toy boats to their friends. Many of these toys are still pretty fun to play with today. There are many others left aside, like toy soldiers and spinning tops. Do you want to know more about ancient toys or gadgets from the early days of cinema? You take off from Earth and park your spacecraft somewhere near the moon. You're now almost 240,000 miles away from your home planet. That's almost 100 widths of the United States. Now you take out a giant hammer and an enormous chisel using the robotic arms of your spaceship. You place the chisel at the Earth's North Pole and strike its head with the hammer. Earth splits open like an eggshell, and you see it, another planet. It's Thea, and it's hiding inside our planet like a yolk in an egg. You'd need to go back in time 4.5 billion years to find out how it got there. This beautiful nebula will soon become our solar system. Colored dust and various space debris are slowly coming closer toward the common center. Soon this jigsaw puzzle of debris becomes too heavy and dense. The temperature inside the giant is rising. Soon it gets so high that it triggers a nuclear chain reaction. Another second and... BAM! There's an explosion so powerful that the shockwaves travel far into dark space. And the blinding flash from this blast can be seen from the other side of the Milky Way galaxy. When the dust clears a little, you can see that a bright light is still shining at the very center of the explosion. This newborn star is the Sun. It weighs as much as 333,000 Earths. If the Sun was a bucket, you'd need 1.3 million Earth-sized planets to fill it. You're interested in a small object over there, 93 million miles away from the Sun. This pile of rocks and hot lava is Earth. Right now, the planet is busy forming its core, while the oceans of lava are gradually cooling down. But a few tens of million years after the Sun's birth, you notice a strange object hurtling toward Earth. It's Thea. This small planet was born at about the same time as Earth, and now it's following a crazy spiral trajectory at enormous speed. Scientists believe Thea was kind of a ball Jupiter and Venus played with. Venus was pulling Thea in one direction, then big brother Jupiter pulled it back. But the Sun makes up 99.8% of the mass of the entire solar system. That's why the star sets its own rules. It makes Thea move in almost the same orbit as Earth. So they inevitably come closer and closer to each other until they become next-door neighbors. We see that Thea is the size of Mars and as wide as the Atlantic Ocean from New York to Portugal. 
A collision can't be avoided. Thea is traveling toward Earth at nearly 9,000 miles per hour. That's 11 times faster than the speed of sound. If the smaller planet crashes into Earth at a particular angle, Earth will most likely be torn apart, as well as Thea itself. The collision will cause a huge blast, visible on other planets even on a bright day. Nothing will be left but some burning dust and debris. Even if Thea touches Earth only lightly, it'll still knock out a chunk of our planet the size of Australia. But the collision with Thea happens at a perfect 45-degree angle. It strikes the Earth at tremendous speed. The explosion literally vaporizes huge amounts of rock, and the shock wave sends the remaining debris into Earth's orbit. A huge crater is formed at the impact site. Soon, it gets filled with boiling lava. The remnants of Thea and the ejected fragments of Earth begin to orbit our planet. According to one version, these fragments form two moons. At first, they travel together, but one day, they get too close to each other and collide, forming one large space body. The other theory claims that all the shards start being pulled by the remnants of Thea. Sometime later, they form the moon as we now know it. At that point in the past, though, it's just red-hot rock and lava. The collision at this angle slightly tilts our planet and accelerates its rotation. It's because of Thea that we have different seasons and 24 hours in a day. Earth has lithospheric plates. These are enormous solid pieces that make up the crust of our planet. After the collision with Thea, they start to break and crack. It causes carbon, a primary component of all known life on Earth, to start moving all over our planet. So, Earth gets some kind of metabolism. After a few hundred million years, the first living creatures start to appear on our planet. Over nearly four billion years, simple single-celled organisms have been evolving into the life you see today. According to scientists, such a collision is a very rare event. The probability that somewhere out there, there's a planet like ours that has survived the same catastrophe is extremely small. This may be the reason why we are yet to find traces of other civilizations out there in space. Meanwhile, the remains of Thea are still here on Earth. Of course, it doesn't look like an entire planet stuck inside our own. Most of the fragments have melted and blended into the Earth's crust. If you take the top layer off our planet, you'll see two huge lava blobs the size of entire continents. They're right below Africa and the Pacific Ocean. Presumably, these are the remains of Thea. They didn't mix with Earth's mantle because of different densities. It's like mixing water and oil in a glass. The oil will always float up over the water and create an even layer on top of it. But if you raise those lava patches up to the surface, they'd be 100 times higher than Mount Everest. Other remains of Thea might be on the moon. The Apollo space missions brought back many soil samples for analysis. Scientists have concluded that the moon is very similar to Earth in structure. People could drill deep down and take samples there. Then they'd analyze the blobs from Earth. If their structure matched, it'd be 100% proof that Thea did hit Earth 4.5 billion years ago. And that's how we got the moon. But for the time being, Thea remains somewhat mysterious. Scientists are still not sure that the planet actually existed. The whole idea perfectly fits the model of the moon's creation. But in fact, this incredible collision may have never happened. Hop on the Bright Side of Life together with our brand new tees, hoodies, and more. Click the link to pick your choice. Now you travel 41 light years away from Earth to the planet 55 Cancri E. It's about twice the size of Earth and eight times heavier. You take out your giant hammer again and use it to hit the chisel. The planet cracks, and you see it's a giant diamond. The temperature on this planet is tens of times higher than that of Earth, and its soil is rich in carbon. The heat puts a lot of pressure on this carbon. Its structure changes. First, it turns into graphite. Some more pressure, and graphite turns into diamond. On Earth, diamonds form at depths below 60 miles, where the pressure is 50,000 times greater than on the surface. The temperatures there rise over 1,000 degrees, which is as hot as fire. Diamonds are ejected closer to the surface in volcanic eruptions. Still, People have to dig mines 1,500 feet deep to find these beautiful gems. The Golden Jubilee Diamond is the biggest cut and faceted diamond on Earth. It weighs as much as a chocolate bar and is the size of a hamster. 
Its price is about $12 million. Now imagine a diamond the size of an entire planet. You decide to fly back to the solar system. Your destination is Jupiter's moon, Europa. It's as wide as the distance between Seattle and Houston, and its mass is less than 1% the mass of Earth. Its surface is enclosed in an icy crust. It's about 19 miles thick. But what if you crack this crust with your giant hammer? Wow, Europa is completely covered in water. It's freezing here, three times colder than at the North Pole on Earth. The water turns into ice almost instantly, but the ocean beneath the surface is still liquid. Europa interacts with Jupiter gravitationally, just like the moon with Earth. This creates tidal forces and heats Europa's core. The core melts the ice around it. The result is a huge ocean, two to three times larger than all of Earth's oceans combined. Scientists believe that water is the basis of life. It may mean that life may exist on Europa. There could be thermal springs, just like at the bottom of our oceans. The water there is probably much warmer. And even though the pressure and temperature in such places are likely to be extreme, simple bacteria may live there. Europa is almost the same age as Earth. This means there has been enough time for living organisms to appear and evolve. Who knows, maybe some advanced civilization is already blooming under this crust of ice. They may be building big cities and dreaming of conquering space right now. But the only thing people can do at the moment is send a probe to Europa and find out if life is possible there.